So St. Augustine is arguably the greatest theologian of the early church. He's born smack dab in the middle of the fourth century. So a bit inland from the North African coast in Tagaste, Numidia, which is actually a modern day Algeria, North Africa. He's born to a pagan father, Patricius, who actually is baptized on his deathbed and a devout Christian mother, St. Monica. Now, eventually he would become the bishop of that diocese, the Diocese of Hippo, but he has to go away first. Now, he's a great pastor and author of tons of theological works, which actually advanced Christian theology enormously. And he died in Hippo shortly before the city fell to the Vandals and became the capital city of their kingdom. So clearly it's the end of the Roman Empire, period. Now, after Constantine, there was a tremendous influx into the church, giving rise to the custom of delaying baptism. Not because there's any doubt about the validity of infant baptism or anything like that, but simply because the sacrament of penance was very severe and can only be given once in a lifetime. So people began thinking, well, oh man, what happens if I sin after baptism? Let's just, let's just hold off, let's wait, that's a freebie, that's gonna cover everything. So Augustine wasn't baptized as an infant, but his mother was very anxious that he be enrolled in catechism class. And he, so he became a catechumen, even though he wasn't baptized yet and didn't plan on getting baptized for a while. In 371, Augustine moved to Carthage to pursue an education, so he kind of went to the big city and education and rhetoric. And so this period begins his departure from the Christian influence of his mother. Now Augustine relates that this was a period of youthful debauchery and included taking an unnamed concubine who would bear him a son, who does get a name, a Deodatus. And he actually cohabitated with this concubine for 15 years, and by all accounts actually seemed to have remained faithful to her while he was with her. And he reveals his grief in having to dismiss her um, on his mom's orders in order to advance socially and marry into a respectable family. My mistress being torn from my side as an impediment to my marriage, my heart which claved to her was racked and wounded and bleeding, which is from his confessions, which is how we know. So Monica had arranged for her son to take a wife, but he had to wait two years for her to come of age. And so during that time, Augustine's lust was uncontained and was wounded by the separation from his first mistress, he actually took another concubine, who unlike his, uh, his first concubine, who had vowed never to take another man. So Augustine takes another one, she does not. So Augustine did not believe in God. He just couldn't really find him, his way to believe in the Christian God. He's like, mm, nope, not for me. So the stories from the Old Testament particularly alarmed him and, and seemed rather infantile. He's like, nope, that can't, that can't be right. So he was more interested in his career and he studied rhetoric, which is really the study of style, which is of course important if you wanna convince someone through writing or speech what you want. So there's a market for people who are good rhetoricians and Augustine became a teacher. So his mother's trying very hard for him to get serious about values and moral values and he does, right? He discovers Cicero, not a Christian, but a Roman and a Roman Stoic. He's actually a politician, but he's also a philosopher. And the life of truth, the pursuit of truth, becomes something very important to Augustine in his late teen years. So he's seeking truth. Where can I find truth? How can I find truth? And his search for truth took him to the Pythagoreans with the Manichaeans, the Neoplatonists, right? This, <laughs> they're not religion. So yes, his mother's praying for religion. So he eventually finds religion, but not the Christian religion. In 373, at the age of 18, he became a hearer or an auditor of the dualist Manichaeism religion. And for nine years, he continued in this faith before questioning the Manichaean teaching about the nature of evil, drove him to reject the Manichaeans and to seek truth elsewhere. So Manichaeans will be like, what is this Manichaeism I keep hearing about, huh, what? So Manny, who it's named after, was born in Babylon, AKA Persia in 216. Now he abandoned the Gnostic sect of his parents in order to form his own sect and become its prophet, an apostle. Awesome, right? He preached in Persia, Mesopotamia, and India before dying while imprisoned by the political authorities. Yeah, they didn't really like him. So when Manny had left the Gnostic faith of his parents, his own religion was Gnostic as well. So the Manichees actually believed in special revelations that gave knowledge of the origin of the world, our current human condition, and our ultimate destiny, right? So we can get special knowledge with this, and Manny was the prophet from Persia. And of course, Persian philosophy is dualistic. So it posits two equal and opposed principle, God and Satan. So Satan is as omniscient and as omnipotent as God, and they're dueling it out. Satan is basically the evil God, essentially. And the body belongs to the evil world and the evil God, and the spirit belongs to the good world and the good God. 
So the origin of the world was seen as a result of an eternal struggle between the principle of light, goodness spirit, and the principle of darkness, evil matter. So the human spirit was part of the divine substance, but was trapped for a time being in matter, which was created by the principle of evil. So the human spirit would find fulfillment when it was able to escape from this entrapment and return to its divine source. This is sanctity for them, right? So this is a very ascetical sort of philosophy, this dualism of spirit matter, uh, light darkness with its echoes of ancient Platonism radically affected the Manichaeans' view of the material world, right? The whole material world is evil. So the more committed members, the perfect ones, typically practice self-renunciation of physical pleasures. I mean, this is eating, drinking, sex, all, all physical pleasures, nope, because matter is evil. And so these were deemed illicit association with the principle of darkness for which they sought to escape. Now, some foods were permitted because they believed that they contained particles of light which were saved by being eaten. So the newer members of the sect, the hearers, were not actually required to live such a strict asceticism. But by association with the perfect, they had some hope of salvation by association, by transmission. Now it's interesting that Augustine's attracted to this, right? He's been attracted to self-denial. We see he was attracted to Cicero and the Stoics who are very much into control and moderations and the virtues, which is something Augustine didn't have, but admires. And Augustine seems to have been attracted to the Manichaeans because it promised to provide a rational and scientific explanation of the world, right? We've always been trying to figure things out rationally. And it's also offered an explanation for the existence of evil in the world, which he also had struggled with, like many people. And so he had struggled with the existence, Augustine had struggled with the existence of God alongside the widespread evidence of evil. He's like, how can these two be? Now in the Manichaean's view, that was two eternal principles, one good, one evil, and initially seemed reasonable to Augustine. And the sect grew and spread over India and China and to the east, and Palestine and Egypt to the west. But then a one of the main leaders of the cult comes to North Africa, who everyone built up as being a super wise man. And Augustine starts to question the foundations of this belief system. So he's hearing this guy and he says, well, you know, this big leader, this man who knows everything, he's a famous teacher. His name's Faustus of Milevis. He comes to North Africa. So everyone's built him up. He's super wise. He's super knowledgeable. He can answer all your questions. So Augustine takes his doubts to him. But he discovers that Faustus' response are just intellectually disappointing. <laughs> so Augustine just abandons the Manichaeans altogether, and his search for truth took another turn, and Augustine decided to move to Rome, and then Milan, where he became a Neoplatonist under the influence of, say, Ambrose of Milan and his Christian teacher, Simplicianus. Okay, so now we have to talk about Ambrose. So we're going to do a separate video on that, and then we'll come back to Augustine in a bit.